We previously discussed the critical value approach to addressing tests of hypotheses. It's an important discussion to have, especially for pedagogical purposes. It helps us understand what hypothesis testing means in the first place. But when we use statistical software to do hypothesis testing, that software doesn't use the critical value approach. It uses something called the p-value approach. We said that with the critical value approach, we have to specify alpha our rejection region in advance. With the p-value approach, we handle this a little bit differently. Let's discuss the p-value approach in the form of six steps, many of which are similar to the steps in the critical value approach. First, we state the null and alternative hypotheses. We could be addressing hypotheses about means, proportions, or variances, or some other statistical question entirely, some of which we'll discuss later in the course. And depending on what kind of underlying question we're wanting to answer, the test could have alternative hypotheses that include strictly unequal, less than, or greater than. Next, we select the appropriate distribution depending on the population parameter that we're testing for. A Z distribution, a T distribution, or a chi-square distribution when we're dealing with parameters from a single population. Third, we calculate the test statistic, which depends on the distribution that is associated with our hypothesis. For example, when our hypotheses deal with a population mean, in the case of sigma being unknown, the test statistic Z0 is Y bar minus mu0 divided by sigma over root n. In the fourth step, we diverge a bit from the critical value approach and calculate for the test statistic what is called the p-value. The p-value is the area under the distribution above or below the test statistic for the appropriate tail associated with the alternative hypothesis. If the test is a lower tail test, then the p-value is the area under the distribution below the test statistic in the lower tail generated by the test statistic. If the test is an upper tail test, the p-value is the area above the test statistic. If the test is a two-tail test, then the p-value is the area in the tail associated with the test statistic multiplied by two, making sure that the p-value doesn't get bigger than one, as it's a probability after all. In the fifth step, we compare the p-value to the desired significance level. You can imagine that if the p-value is small, that is, the area of the tail associated with the test statistic is small, then the test statistic would probably fall in the rejection region. That's the idea behind the p-value. We eliminate the need to determine alpha in advance. We just find the area in the tail associated with the test statistic and compare it to alpha. If it's bigger than alpha, then the test statistic wouldn't lie in the rejection region. Let's take a look at three different values on the z-axis with three different upper tail areas. Say that CV defines the rejection region. That is, CV is the critical value and say that the area in the tail, or alpha, is 0.05. Now, let's say that Z1 lies to the right of the critical value, and it has a tail area of 0.02. And Z2 lies to the left of the critical value, with a tail area of 0.07. So of Z1 and Z2, which would lie in the rejection region? Naturally, Z1 would lie in the rejection region, as Z1 lies in the tail created by the critical value. But we don't need the critical value, we could just look at the area in the tail created by Z1. It's less than alpha of 0.05, so we know that Z1 must lie in the rejection region. Likewise, the tail area created by Z2 is greater than alpha of 0.05, so Z2 must lie in the non-rejection region. And the tail areas created by Z1 and Z2 are p-values for those test statistics. So all we need are the p-values, and we compare to alpha. The nice thing about the p-value approach is you can have your own alpha with which you'll make a decision, and I can have mine. If you want to be more confident in your answer, you may interpret the result differently than me if my alpha is greater. That is, if I don't need to be convinced as strongly. This is why statistical software generally provides a p-value result. You can interpret the result with an alpha of your choosing. Another way to think about the p-value is the smallest value of alpha that would lead to a rejection of the null hypothesis. With the last step, we make a decision. If the p-value is less than alpha, we reject H0. If the p-value is greater than alpha, we do not reject H0. If the p-value is exactly equal to alpha, then go ahead and reject the null, though that's not likely to happen. If the p-value is smaller than 0.01, then that's a convincing amount of evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Between 0.01 and 0.05 is strong evidence. Between 0.05 and 0.1 is moderate evidence and a p-value greater than 0.1 is weak or not evidence at all of rejecting the null. Let's revisit the example of tire tread life. 
let mu denote the true mean tread life in miles of a certain type of tire. A sample of 16 tires were drawn from a normal population whose standard deviation is 1,500 miles. With 90% confidence, we're interested in learning if the true average tread life is greater than 30,000 miles. The mean tread life from the sample was 31,000 miles. First, the hypotheses. Just like with our discussion of the critical value approach, because we're trying to determine if the true average tread life is greater than 30,000 miles, the alternative hypotheses should be H1 states that mu is greater than 30,000 miles. The null hypothesis must contain an equality statement because equality is always in the null. So H0 is that mu is less than or equal to 30,000 miles. Second, we select the distribution. Here we know sigma explicitly to be 1,500 miles. As such, we know that we're dealing with hypotheses about a population mean when sigma is known. The test statistic will follow a Z distribution. Next, we calculate the value of the test statistic. We know that we're using a Z statistic. Z naught is Y bar minus mu naught divided by sigma over root n. That's 31,000 minus 30,000 divided by 1,500 over root 16. The value of the test statistic is 2.67. That is, Y bar lies 2.67 standard deviations away from the hypothesized value. Fourth, we calculate the p-value associated with Z naught. The rejection region is in the upper tail, so the p-value is the area under the z-distribution lying above z naught. We go to the z-table. We go to the 2.6 row and over to the 0.07 column, and we find that the area between 0 and 2.67 is 0.4962. Therefore, the p-value in the tail is 0.5 minus 0.4962, or 0.0038. Next, we compare the p-value to the level of alpha of our choosing. In this case, we wanted to draw a conclusion with 90% confidence, so alpha is 0.1. The p-value is quite a lot smaller than alpha, so we reject the null hypothesis. Just to be clear, we're saying that if we found the critical value for alpha of 0.1 in the upper tail, our test statistic would lie to the right of it, in the rejection region, because the p-value is smaller than alpha. Finally, we draw a conclusion about the null hypothesis. Since the p-value is smaller than alpha, we reject the null and conclude that the mean tread life is greater than 30,000 miles. And we can draw that conclusion with a statement stronger than 90% confidence. In fact, even at 99% confidence, we draw the same conclusion. A p-value of 0.0038 leads to a convincing rejection of the null.